Hi, everyone. All right, looks like we are we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first Fast Forward Live live stream, where we're going to be digging in today on the topic of representation learning through a software engineer's perspective. So thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, we're super excited that you're here today, and we're also very excited to be here. Um, my name is Andrew Reed, and I am a research engineer here at Cloudera Fast Forward Labs. Uh, and I'm streaming in today from my home office here in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, today, I'll be joined by my colleague, Victor Dibia. So, hey, Victor, um, good afternoon, or I guess uh, good, good morning for you. Uh, why don't you share with everybody where you're streaming in from and introduce yourself? Absolutely. Um, so, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Victor Dibia. I'm a research engineer with Cloudera Fastball Labs, and I'm streaming in from sunny Sunnyvale, California. Uh, the weather is kind of good today. It's about 63, pretty sunny, so quite comfortable. <laughs> a little bit better than uh, than we've got here in Baltimore. It's about 40 and rainy, so a little oh. jealous. <laughs> yeah. A little jealous of uh, Sunnyville, California. Yeah. Well, hopefully you can come over sometime. <laughs> All right. Well, it looks like we have a number of people uh, joining in now. So hello to everyone out there. Um, welcome, and, and thanks again for joining in. Um, please feel free to drop us a hello, say hello in the chat. Um, let us know where you're streaming in from. Um, and for anybody who is joining us today that is familiar with or maybe has attended our webinars in the past, um, I do have a news update for you. Uh, we are no longer hosting our webinars and instead we'll actually be holding these uh, live stream events. Um, and so thanks to the power of the internet, we can actually stream live to your home offices across a number of social media channels all at once. And so today, we're actually streaming across YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Um, and this gives us the added benefit of being able to actually interact with everybody out there live in real time. Um, so with that, uh, why don't we go ahead and actually have a quick practice. Um, so anyone out there who's, who's live with us, please drop us a chat, um, in the, in the, uh, a message in the chat window on whatever platform you're on. Um, tell us who you are, where you're from, uh, maybe what your role is. Uh, or maybe what you're interested in from learning about our talk today. So go ahead and do that now. Awesome. So um, right on the on YouTube, I see Nick from Austin, Texas. Um, hello, Nick. Thanks for joining us today. Hey there, Nick. I see I see Mike, a, a software engineer from Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Nice. Also sunny. Better what better weather than Baltimore here. Hey, Mike. Hi, Mike. Welcome. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, it looks like we've got quite a few people joined in now. Yeah, uh, I also see Cobb from Stafford VA. So, well, welcome, Cobb. Thanks for joining in. Awesome. Hey, Cobb. All right, great. Um, it's great to see everybody, and thank you for, for joining us uh, today. We're very excited to have you. Um, before we get into our main topic for the today, I just want to give a brief introduction to who we are at Cloudera Fast Forward Labs. So in one second, I will be sharing my screen. Okay, cool. Um, so just a quick introduction to us for those who may not be familiar. Um, at Cloudera Fast Forward Labs, we are an applied machine learning research team uh, and we work to make the recently possible useful. So really looking to bridge the gap between uh, the newest advances, advances in machine learning and the practical imp implementations and uses of those advances. So what that means is that our team works to stay up to date with the latest that goes on in machine learning and tries to figure out what works, uh, un under what conditions that might work, and how it can actually be applied. And then also what new capabilities and different algorithmic techniques might be, uh, might be able to unlock from, in a real world setting. And so our mechanism for, oops, looks like we jumped to the wrong slide. And so our mechanism for uncovering these insights is really just to build things, um, particularly applied prototypes. And then we write about them, uh, write about the prototypes and our development process along the way through the form of blogs, articles, and reports. And our goal in, in doing so is really to give data scientists and business leaders an honest perspective on the capabilities around these new machine learning technologies. 
So here on the screen, we see a few snippets from our most recent research reports that we've been working on. Um, and for future reference, everyone can, uh, can stay up to date with our work by following uh, our newsletter and our blog. And I think the production team should be sharing uh, the links to our blog and the newsletter into the chat now. Um, so feel free to go ahead and subscribe and follow, us, uh, follow along with us there. All right, great. So in just a moment, um, I'm going to be handing things back over to Victor, who is going to dive in on the topic of discussion for the day, which is representation learning for software engineers. Um, and as we do so, please feel free to just ask questions as we go in the chat, um, just like we had practiced earlier. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be monitoring the chats for any incoming questions. And we'll actually have an opportunity at the end for a live Q&A session with Victor right after his presentation and demo. Um, so please do ask any questions you have. And to further encourage everyone's participation, um, for those of you who do engage with us today, uh, they'll be in the running to win this awesome prize um, that Clutter has graciously allotted for us. Uh, it's actually pretty incredible. Uh, and through a new partnership we have with Yamaha, I am really excited to be able to give away this awesome Cloudera branded Yamaha YZF R1M street bike. Um, I honestly personally don't know a whole lot about motorcycles, but this thing does look awesome. And it's such a treat to be able to actually give this away today in our short little time on this live stream. Um, actually, the only criteria that you need to have to be in the running to win this awesome prize is that you're gonna have to ask at least one question in the chat. So you need to engage with us. And then you must be present at the end of the stream to actually win it. Um, so that's really all it's going to take to uh, have the chance to win this incredible prize today. All right, I'm just kidding. Um, today is April 1st, so we did have to play a little joke with everybody. Uh, I hope no one's too upset. Um, as much as I'd love to be able to give away such a cool prize, uh, I might end up losing my job, and I don't want that to happen. Um, but all jokes aside, we do actually have some awesome Cloudera swag to give away. So for real, there will be a raffle and two winners um, will win the prize as you've seen here. So the first place in the raffle will win this uh, Cloudera Zip Up hoodie. I actually have this hoodie. It's uh, super comfortable. I wear it all the time. Um, and then the second place prize will be a pair of Cloudera socks uh, that are also really awesome. And just like our fictitious street bike, um, the rules to win are that you must ask at least one question in the chat. So you have to be engaged. Um, and then you have to be present at the end of the stream uh, we're thinking the stream should take about 30 minutes. Um, so please do stick around, please engage with us, and uh, thanks for being here. All right, so without further ado, um, I'm gonna pass things back over to Victor, who's gonna get us started um, and share some insights around representation learning from a software engineering perspective. So over to you, Victor. So I'm having just a couple of challenges um, sharing my screen. Just bear with me a second. Um, in the meantime, uh, Andrew, can you share the slides if that's possible? Just having a couple of challenges with screen share. And I'll tell you how to advance the slides. I think that'll work perfectly. Excellent. So if we get to the next slide, um, today we're going to be talking about uh, software engineering uh, tips, especially for software engineers who are kind of interested in representation learning. Um, again, my name is Victor Divia. Um, I'm a research engineer with Cloudera Fast Forward Labs. And our agenda today is kind of uh, really brief because we have just about 30 minutes. And so for the first part, we're going to look at like what and why, um, why do we care about representation learning? Um, we're going to look at methods for representation learning. Then we're going to kind of talk through um, how do we choose what method and when, and then we'll walk through a nice little demo. And then finally, we'll look at practical considerations and we'll leave a ton of time for Q&A. Um, next slide. Yeah, so um, talking about uh, why representation learning, a really good way to motivate this topic is to kind of think of all the different tasks that a software engineer has to kind of accomplish. And so uh, um, on, on the minimum, next slide, please. 
um, on the minimum, uh, the software engineer just needs to solve problems using data. And this might take multiple forms. Next slide. So first of all, you might start with multiple types of data. And so on one hand, you might have text data, image data, um, um, logs, uh, interaction stream. And the goal is to take all of this data and solve problems across multiple um, problem domains. Uh, next slide. And so first of all, if we think of classification problems, um, one example is that the software engineer might need to answer the question, is this a cat or not? Um, moving to a more serious example uh, in manufacturing, um, we might want to know, um, is a product that just comes off the assembly line, is this a good product? Was it well uh, crafted? Is it defective? And then even at the, in the, in the domain of medicine, we might want to know, does a medical image, let's say an x-ray, is this indicative of disease? Um, next slide. Following up, if we look at the problem domain of search, um, we might want to answer questions like, um, how might users find uh, content on our, on, on our platform? And so imagine that you're a software engineer and your task is to implement the shop delete. And so here you want users to kind of upload uh, an image and then you want to show them all the image within your catalog that's exactly uh, similar to the image that they have provided. And so also in the legal domain, you might want to help uh, lawyers prepare a little bit better for their cases. And so in this case, they might put in some data about their current case and you want to show them all the other cases within the database that are most similar to this case. Finally, in the recommendation space, um, you might want to offer users uh, recommendations as they kind of browse through your website. So you probably want to take into consideration their current context, the things they've done in the past, and then you want to show them uh, examples of things that they might be interested in, personalized to their own context. And to achieve all of these things, um, it turns out that having good representations of your data uh, is kind of critical. Uh, next slide, please. And so um, it turns out that if we take a representation learning approach, and I'll spend some time trying to define what representation learning means uh, in a little while, we can take all of the data, we can get a neural network to give us these nice numbers that represent the data. And because these numbers have or encode semantic meaning, it makes it a lot easier to solve all of these different problems. In theory, you could use any um, machine learning algorithm uh, within the black box, uh, classic learning algorithm. Um, on machine learning algorithms. Uh, but in, in practice, uh, research and uh, experiments kind of show that, um, especially if you're working with uh, large data sets of text, image, natural language, uh, deep learning neural networks kind of do the best job at uh, mimicking human perception uh, behavior, and they just give the best results. So next slide. Um, what exactly is representation learning? And so um, they are not exactly perfect uh, definitions of this. But one definition that I really like is uh, from a paper from 2013 uh, by Yoshua Bengio. And they kind of describe it as learning representations of data um, that make it easier to extract useful information when building classifiers or other predictives. A really simple way to think about it is to imagine that um, we have our raw data and now we want to Instead of this raw data, we want to represent it using numbers that have these really nice properties that given these numbers, we can then easily solve a bunch of other tasks. Um, next steps. Um, in a, in a follow-up book, uh, the same authors kind of also allude to the fact that um, the way we design our representation, the neural network we use for this, um, usually would uh, kind of be influenced by the sort of task we're interested in solving. Um, next step. Next slide. And so if you remember the cat and not cat problem that I kind of alluded to earlier, um, we could use that as a really concrete example to kind of illustrate uh, how deep neural networks might help uh, uh, via representation learning. And so on the left, if we, if we look at the default representation of, uh, of our content, uh, in this case, our images of cats and dogs, if we took uh, those pixels from the raw data and we plotted it in two dimensions, uh, we probably can see that there are no like clear structures or 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 patterns that can help us solve uh, tasks or ask interesting questions. However, if we have a deep neural network that is trained appropriately, we can pass our data through this network and then get numbers that represent our text 
such that if we plotted it in two dimensional space, we can suddenly ask all these interesting questions. Like if we have a new image, is it a cat? Is it a dog? And even within that space, we can even ask questions like, is it a black cat? Is it a red cat? Is it a blue dog? Is it a black cat? And so um, these are all really, really nice things that we can do. And so the promise here is that we can take a raw data and using deep neural networks, we can project it in, into the space that, um, that lets us really easily solve all those problems. So the question is, how do we get this deep neural network? Where does it come from? Uh, next slide. And so it turns out that there are three uh, dominant approaches for uh, building these neural networks that help us learn representations. And so the first is uh, supervised uh, learning methods, um, self-supervised learning methods, or semi-supervised learning methods. And then finally, unsupervised, uh, uh, unsupervised learning methods. And so if we dig deep a little more into the supervised learning method, we, in this space, we make a couple of assumptions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, within the supervised, uh, supervised uh, learning kind of paradigm, we make a couple of assumptions. And so the first big assumption is that we have a large amount of labeled training data. And so uh, in many cases, this might not be, the, this might not be available and mainly because uh, labeling data is really expensive and in many cases you actually need experts to kind of label data. And so the idea is that if we have some labels that encode uh, some sort of semantic meaning, and so an example here is uh, the ImageNet training data set, and we have labels for that, we can get a model to solve the task of correctly classifying images into all of these labels. And then we can trust that as the model learns to successfully solve that task, it has, uh, it learns all these interesting properties about images and yields these nice representations that we can use for multiple other problems. And so for example, this is the kind of, uh, this structure is what we rely on when we do transfer learning because we assume that, that a model trained on, on, on ImageNet has learned all these nice properties about ImageNet and uh, has learned all these nice properties about images. And then we can reuse all of these representations for other tasks. Uh, next slide, please. So perhaps uh, some of the limitations of a fully supervised approach is that you need labeled data sets. Um, in some cases, uh, whatever you learn from a labeled data set might not transfer well to other domains. And there's some research that kind of shows that, you know, a uh, supervised learning paradigm might be sus uh, s uh, really susceptible to adversarial attacks. And so self-supervised or semi-supervised learning kind of improves that a little bit and it's, it's an area I'm super excited about because it creates this opportunity for us to take advantage of really large data sets, but kind of avoid the cost associated with having to label all of this data. And so how do we do that? So the primary approach is that we design something called a pretext task. And so in this case, this task is an artificial task that we give to a neural network to solve. And we kind of hope that if we have designed this task to be both meaningful and relevant, relevant to some task, we can get like these nice representations uh, uh, as a side product from getting the neural network model to solve this task. A concrete example would be to get a neural network to pre predict the rotation of an image. And so we have like a couple million images we have downloaded from the internet. And at some point we, um, and at some point we, we apply a couple of transformations like rotations to these images, and then we get a neural network to predict what these rotations or transformations are. And so in this case, the rotation angle is like a pseudo label, and we can then train this model using this task. And it turns out that at the end of this process, if we design this task really well, um, this model learns representations that we can use for other like image analysis problems. Of course, the challenge here is that you need to design your pretext task really carefully. Um, the entire process might be compute intensive, and some of the learned features might need to be further fine-tuned uh, to be used elsewhere. And so if you look at models like BERT, uh, traditional language models, ULM, GPT-3, GPT-2, um, essentially what they have done there is that they have designed a really nice pretext task. In this case, it's things like mass language models, given a stream of tokens, uh, we hide a token and we want to uh, get the model to predict what it is. And then in the image domain, we have models like Suave and Marco, 
and more recently multimodal to me, uh, models like flip and dolly and then the final approach to um, learning representations is uh, fully unsupervised methods. And here we just task a model to learn the underlying data distribution of our data. And we kind of assume that uh, when a model is successful at that, it also learns uh, good representations. Um, in practice, this doesn't work really well and definitely should not be high on your list. Um, next slide. And so, um, how do we choose? Uh, how do we choose the, the next uh, uh, our approach for choosing models? And so, one of the things we can always start with is that whenever we're in doubt, uh, we can start with pre-trained uh, model baselines. Um, next slide. And so, a good rule of thumb is uh, for whatever problem we're trying to solve, um, um, if we have situations where it falls within uh, spaces like natural language processing. Um, processing natural images and videos. Um, there are a ton of nice pre-trained models that we can start out with, and that's definitely um, a practical way to begin exploration. However, if you also have um, a lot of task-related uh, legal data, um, another approach that you can kind of explore is to um, use the completely supervised learning approach. And there's a paper from Pinterest that kind of shows that um, when they use uh, a completely supervised learning approach, they're able to get um, they're able to get really nice representations. It helps them solve multiple tasks. And then finally, if you have lots of unlabeled data, you can design a, a pretext task, and we just can design a pretext task for many reasons. You can then explore fully unsupervised methods. Next slide. And so, how do you evaluate evaluate uh, your representations? Um, so there's also a nice quote from uh, the Benji book that says, um, what is a, they try to describe what a good or ideal representation is. And they kind of allude to the fact that um, a good representation is one in which the features within the representation uh, correspond to the underlying causes of the observed yeah, such that the representation kind of disentangles causes from one another. Um, this, this, all this conversation kind of alludes to, you know, the fact that good representations kind of have um, the ability to disentangle uh, causes, the underlying causes of data, because causality is a completely different research topic. But the important thing to note here is that um, it can be really, really hard to directly evaluate uh, uh, or quantify this property. Uh, next slide. And so uh, it turns out that most of the time, what people will do is that uh, when you have a set of uh, uh, a set of representations, uh, the way you would evaluate that would be to evaluate its performance in a downstream task. And so, uh, in addition to that, um, another approach that I have found super helpful was to also um, explore visualization approaches of the embeddings or the vectors learned by any method and then qualitatively kind of inspect if that kind of meets my expectations. And so this is a good time to switch to a demo. And so I'll try to share my screen again and just to make see if that goes well. I'll attempt that one more time. Hey there, Victor. I don't think we can uh, we can hear you at the moment.
Why don't we try me sharing my screen and I can, we can get you back on the voiceover. Yes. Yes, we got both working. Hey, Victor, hey, Victor, hold up one second, Victor. I don't think we can hear or see you live anymore. Um, let's see if I can share my screen and you can voice over as I present. <clears throat> Okay, it looks like we've got the... All right, it looks like we've got Continent Playground up. Can you see this, Victor? Okay, cool. Hey, Victor. Hey, Victor. I think we're still having trouble with your audio. Um, can you give a try maybe exiting out of Social Live and joining back in and see if we can get it to work that way? <laughs> Sorry, everyone out there having a little bit of uh, technical troubles getting getting Victor up here. Let's see if him joining back in is going to work for us. All right, looks like Victor's back. We cannot hear you. We can hear you now. All right, cool. So I'm gonna attempt to screen share again. Um, Okay. So, assuming this goes well, uh, one final time. Uh, unfortunately, demos always um, have a bit of a glitch. And so, right. And so, I'll just go over them again super fast. Um, essentially, each time we uh, select an image, we get a neural network to make a decision and what are the most similar images within our data sets that are related to the image we just selected? And in order for a data scientist to implement a feature like this, they need to make a few decisions. And so the first has to do with um, what pre-trained model architecture do I use? And even if I select the, a model architecture, do I use the entire feature set of this model or do I use intermediate models? And what are the implications of this for uh, search performance? And so in this case, if we look at exception, we can see that layer 31 kind of gives us 100% performance on the specific text. And then as we go down, uh, look at layer layers, we can see that uh, search performance kind of degrades. And one question might be, why does this happen? 
uh, to kind of make sense of that, we can look at the embeddings learned by exception. So in this case, if we look at uh, layer one of exception, we can see that, and we plot all of the representations assigned to each of the images in the data set. We can see that it, it looks a bit random. Uh, there's not an exact uh, clustering or structure to this. But as we get into lower uh, layers, uh, we can see that those models have a bit more modeling capacity and they're able to assign um, numbers or vectors or representations to each of the uh, data points that are sort of meaningful. And as we get towards the last layer, we can see that there are these nice clusters. And so we see that the Eiffel Tower is clustered in the top right. Um, the Empire State Building is on the top right also. And here we have this nice cluster of different classes, but the interesting thing is that here are Ferrari cars and sedans and Vitol cars and they're all cars. And so the, the, the idea is that, you know, for this specific data set, um, representations learned by the later layers of exception uh, do a lot of a better job than earlier layers. We can apply the same sort of approach to uh, taking any random image from the internet and getting the model to also uh, find uh, um, images that are most similar to our current data set uh, uh, for, uh, for any of the random images. Um, the code that's used for all of this is, um, is, is, uh, is available on, on our GitHub page, and I kind of like encourage everyone to, uh, to look through it when you have some time. We also have a notebook that walks through all the different steps that, that, can, that, that are kind of useful for this. Back to my slides. Second. Share screen. So we're towards the end of the, the, the presentation, and I guess some of the pra practical considerations here is just to note that we only skimmed the surface. And so the truth is that in practice, um, most of the time, you might not only care about just text or image embeddings independently. You might need to uh, explore joint embeddings of text, images, and sequences. Um, in addition to that, um, we might also have to uh, optimize the model. And so in this case, we might want to consider things like model quantization, pruning, distillation, just to make these things more efficient in practice uh, when, when, when they're deployed. And then finally, uh, the vectors or representations that you get from deep neural networks can be large and complex to store and query. And so for that, we, it's useful to, con uh, to consider dimensionality reduction uh, approaches things like binarization of vectors just to convert from floats to integer uh, representations. And then we probably want to consider things like approximate nearest neighbor search uh, using indexes like ANOI, FAISS, and SCAN. And so to recap, um, here are a couple of takeaways. And so uh, representation learning is only important because it really helps us find representations that make problem solving easier. Um, when possible, always start with pre-trained models. Um, don't forget to optimize models and um, uh, in order to kind of search and query over your, your representations, your vectors, um, an algorithm like SCAN, uh, which actually outperforms FAISS and ANOI, uh, is definitely recommended. And so at this point, uh, here are a couple of resources. Uh, so a link to the demo that I just showed, um, the code for the demo I showed, a blog post that discusses all of these and a link to the found algorithm. So at this point, we can take a couple of questions. Awesome. Thanks for, um, for sharing all that, Victor. I know there was a few technical difficulties, but uh, the demo looked great and the content was awesome. We do have a few questions uh, that have come through. Um, Victor, if you want to st stop sharing your screen, you can hop back on with me. Um, it looks like we have one question from uh, from YouTube. Mike wants to know a little bit more about multimodal learning. Um, I believe you mentioned that in one of your slides, Victor. 
Um, can you just give a little more context about what you mean by multimodal learning and how that's relevant and, applic and applicable to uh, representation learning? Sorry, what was that? Oh, you didn't get the question? Um, so the question was about multimodal learning. Um, you had mentioned it on, on one of the slides, and uh, somebody was just interested in if you could give a little more context about what that is and how it applies to right. uh, representation learning. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's 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 a great question. Um, and so it turns out that in, in many uh, real world use case uh, examples, you might need to explore uh, representations that kind of cut across multiple modalities. And uh, an example of a modality being, being like natural language um, images and also sequences. And so it, let, let's consider a use case of recommending ads. And so if you wanted to recommend an ad to a user, you need to model properties of the user and also properties of the ad. And so in this case, to model properties of the user, you might need uh, embeddings on the user, which could be um, kind of derived using uh, a traditional fit for a neural network. You also need like embeddings on the context of the user uh, at that particular time. And so it might be things like the user has clicked on within the last hour, or the last 20 minutes. And you also need like embeddings on a list of all the ads in your, in your database. And so it's uh, embeddings on the text within the data, uh, within the ad, and also the images within the ad. And then you learn a joint embedding space across these three. And this this would be an example of a sort of multimodal embedding. On, and then, yeah. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. So I think um, in one of the slides, it mentioned something about clip and dally. So <clears throat> the idea of um, these representations that are sit in between both text and image is probably a good example of, of, what, of multimodal. Um, but that makes sense. Um, I think given that we're, we took a little bit of time with our technical difficulties, I think we're going to um, cut our, our Q&A a little bit short. And we'll, uh, we'll pause it there, and we'll hop over to the raffle um, and see who gets to win the Cloudera swag that we have. So let me just share my screen and remind everybody of uh, the prizes that we have today. OK. Um, so the first place in the raffle is going to take home um, this Cloudera Zip hoodie. And second place is going to get a pair of these socks that we see here. Um, so we'll move on over to the uh, raffle picker. And so anybody who had asked a question, um, had engaged with us, and is still present is going to be listed in here. Looks like we have a few people. Um, and so the lucky first place winner of the Cloudera Hoodie Zip is going to be Makaran Ved. So congrats, Makaran. Um, for both of, both of these prizes, uh, we'll actually be sharing in the uh, chat now how you can get in touch with us to claim your prize. And the second place winner for the socks is going to be uh, Rohith. So Rohith and Makarand, um, congratulations. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it was great to have you. Uh, we apologize for the technical difficulties, um, but we're excited to see you on the next, next one of these. And uh, thank you all for joining.